I've been sharing my heart with a lot of you people, but there's some things that just uh, were difficult for me. And one of them is, uh, is about my younger brother. But today, I'm ready to tell you the story. Hey everyone, welcome to another sit down with Michael Francis. Hope everybody is doing well on this Friday, November 20th, and it is the weekend before Thanksgiving. And hope everybody is doing well. And I know that uh, for some, it's not gonna be a great Thanksgiving. We've gotten a lot of uh, COVID restrictions. I know here in Southern California, uh, they're tr trying their best to restrict us on Thanksgiving. When I say trying their best, that maybe that's not the right terminology, but you know, only two or three members of the family, they're putting curfews on us, telling us how to eat, you know, how to breathe, when to wear a mask, to go inside, outside. <clears throat> you know, a whole bunch of rules and regulations that honestly, um, I'm not too happy with. And listen, I'm not downplaying the extent of the virus, I understand it, but uh, I am not in agreement with the way that uh, it's being handled. And that's just my opinion. I think that Thanksgiving is a day we should be able to get together responsibly, intelligently, and enjoy a nice Thanksgiving meal. We don't have to wait till next year for that. But at any rate, it is what it is, and I know we'll all make the best of it, and we'll get through it, and we'll move on to the next stage, which is Christmas, and let's see what happens then, right, people? So enjoy this first weekend before that. I want to thank everybody for the subscribers that keep coming on. Uh, the site keeps growing. I thank you very much for that. We've got a lot of good content. I spoke to Mike Tyson recently, and that interview is going to be set up uh, at some point after the fight. Are going to be setting up at Slices, uh, something you're going to look forward to. It's going to be a good one. We don't want to do a Zoom, so look forward to that. Uh, what else? Uh, my MichaelFrancis.com, my crew. It's getting bigger and bigger. We had a great Zoom call with many of the members today, um, and they had great questions. We have good sessions a couple of times a month where people you know, have access to me. We're able to speak to them, answer some of their issues, give them some you know, great advice and, and encouragement. A lot of people are encouraging one another. So I encourage you to join, especially through these tough times. People are having such great, great, great benefits from it. So get involved. Today, I'm gonna to speak about uh, something that uh, obviously very close to me, something I haven't really spoken about in the past. There's certain things within my family that I don't like to talk about. Uh, but today I'm ready to kind of open up my heart because I've been asked about it many times. And uh, this is really about my brother, John Jr. and my sister, Gia. And uh, I don't like to talk about these things that were pretty uh, upsetting throughout you know, our family life, but I think today I've been asked enough about it and I'm ready to share these things with you. My sister, Gia, my younger sister, I believe many of you know she died of an overdose. So not really an overdose, but she died um, of uh, <clears throat> heart failure after snorting, taking, you know, too much cocaine. She had been on cocaine. She went on it in an early part of her life. I think she was 17, 18, and did it for a number of years and was, you know, on it, off it, so on and so forth, um, until finally when she was 27 years old in a hotel room in Florida, it seems that whatever dose she took at that point in time uh, caused her to have uh, cardiac arrest, and she passed away. <clears throat> it was a great blow to me, my family, I love my younger sister. She was a lot like me in many ways, and it was very, very tough. And, you know, I see that as a direct result of the breakup of in our family when uh, my father went off to prison and all the issues and all of the, you know, tragic situations that we had as a result. So that was that. And now getting to my brother, I get a lot of questions about this because some of you know, you know, his situation, but many of you don't. So I will tell you this. My brother also had a drug problem most of his life. Started out when he was young, when my dad was in prison. Uh, I think it started with uh, pot, marijuana. And um, I'm not saying it's always a gateway drug, so don't call me on this. But I think with him, it started with marijuana. Then he you know, eventually graduated to, uh, you know, Coke also and whatever else he was snorting. I don't know, you know, for sure. It's always hard to get information out of a, out of a you know, a person that's on drugs. 
But anyway, it affected him greatly. It affected our whole family. I can tell you this, when people are on drugs, you got to watch everything in your house. If anything, when they get on their habit and they need money and they got to buy, your televisions get missing, things in your house get missing. We've tracked this for 10, 12 years. Went through this with my kid brother and sister. With my brother, it was a little bit worse because he was out on the street. He was a, a kind of a street kid and he got involved in some home invasions and things, you know, nothing ever major, but just a lot of stuff that wasn't good. Got himself in and out in trouble. Quite honestly, um, if it wasn't for me and my dad, my brother would have never lasted. He would have probably gotten killed because of the different things that he did and the people that he crossed. And uh, it was just a tough situation for many, many years. But the worst thing that happened, uh, I guess about 10 or 12 years ago, maybe, you know, no, a little longer than that, you know, maybe 2008, 2009, uh, my dad was home and I got a, on parole and I got a call from my mother. Where's your brother? We haven't seen him for a couple of days. And I said, I don't know. And I uh, started to call around a little bit, couldn't find him. Now he got worried, you know, something happened, you know, maybe he got killed. Maybe, you know, he, he got on the wrong side of the wrong person. It was very possible with the life that he was leading. Turns out we find out uh, just a short time later that he was in the witness protection program. And what happened is uh, he had got himself in some issues and uh, um, decided that he was going to cooperate with the FBI. And he started cooperating earlier than any of us had known about it. As a matter of fact, what we found out later on that it was his cooperation uh, that initially got my dad violated on one of his parole violations. We didn't know how it happened at the time, it was kept kind of undercover. We found out later on that information that he provided did get my dad violated. Um, when my dad went in that time, my brother comes out and uh, stays with me. And um, he was living in my house. You know, he was cleaning up his act. And I told him, bro, you know, I love you. You can live with me under two conditions. Number one, you don't bring any drugs into this house anywhere around your nieces and nephews, my kids. Don't do it. If you do that, automatic expulsion. Number two, don't talk to me about business. We've been down that road. I don't want to get involved. It caused me headaches with business. I once gave him a gas station to operate, gave him $160,000 worth of gas. Within three days, the station was closed. The gas was gone. So was the money. Figure that one out. But um, <clears throat> I said, don't talk to me about business. He was doing okay. He was in rehab. He was starting to get his act together, found a young woman. They eventually got married. Denise, it was her name. I said, okay, he's doing pretty good. My father gets off of parole, I mean, gets uh, uh, out of prison, goes back on parole, calls for my brother. My brother goes back to New York. And, um, you know, I thought everything was okay. You know, things were going good. I'm out here in California. I'm hearing from them back and forth, visiting my dad. Everything's okay. And then, like I said, 2008, my brother's gone. Gone. He's in the witness protection program. Turns out he had wired himself up and met with my father and had my father on tape and some meetings that were not good and some situations that were not good and also a bunch of other people. So my brother was actually working undercover. My father gets indicted along with a few other guys based upon uh, information that my uh, brother provided, wiretap information or bugging devices. He had a little transponder, uh, uh, transformer, whatever they call it, in his Yankee cap. It was so small and it was uh, so effective that uh, picked up a ton of conversations. They weren't good. And as a result, my dad gets indicted again with a few other people. My brother testifies against my father at trial. And people, uh, it was one of the worst things that we ever had to experience as a family. I was there uh, during the trial, watched my brother testify. Certain things that he said, he just wasn't telling the truth. I know that. And that was very upsetting. My father was devastated over it. He couldn't believe it, his own t son testifying against him. Because, look, my father had his issues, but uh, he loved his kids. I know that. He certainly loved me, loved my brother, loved all his kids. Just uh, sometimes the way he was, his inability to express it because of all the time that he did in prison was, was tough. Anyway, um, my dad gets convicted, gets sentenced to eight years in prison, goes back to prison. I think you know the story. He does another eight years. He gets out at the age of 100, and uh, he passed away earlier this year at the age of 103. My brother's been gone, you know, for years. He was in the program. I, I forgot to mention also that during the time on the street, as a result of his drug problem, his drug addiction, uh, he did uh, contract the HIV virus. 
and he was on medication constantly for that. And I can tell you this, people, uh, it may not sound right, but I believe that one of the reasons my brother cooperated was because the federal government paid for his medication. It was very expensive. Paid for his medication. <clears throat> uh, they certainly gave him some money. He wasn't a big earner, for sure. And they took care of him for a couple of years. And this all came out on the stand, you know, gave him a couple hundred thousand dollars, if I recall. And uh, so it's been a lot of years. And um, about a year and a half ago, my brother recently came out of the witness protection program. He uh, appeared, he got in touch with me, got in touch with my dad. I think he visited my dad one time before my dad passed away. I wasn't there, I don't know how that meeting was. I understand that when uh, my father first saw my brother, he didn't recognize him. And my brother and I have been in contact, you know, for, he was a good uncle to uh, his nieces and nephews. They loved him. When I say good, they loved being around him. He did treat them right. And it was devastating to them when he went into the program and disappeared. My oldest boy, who was very close to, to my brother, he took it very personal. He was very upset that my brother never told him what was going on and uh, still hasn't moved himself or been able to bring himself to talk to my brother. I've spoken to my brother. I've forgiven my brother. I don't like what he did. Uh, I don't think it's justified. I don't think there's any excuse, even though if you hear his side of the story, I guess you can kind of relate to some things that he went through. I don't know, but there's no justification in my mind for what he did do. But of course I've forgiven him. He's my brother, my kid brother. I love him. I am a Christian. I believe in forgiveness. Um, you know, where that's going to go, I don't know. It's a sad story for him because he kind of lives alone. Uh, obviously, he's not with his wife that he had married at that time. He just up and left her. Uh, but he seems at peace right now. He's, he's come to faith in a way, and he's, he's kind of trying to live his life and trying to do the right thing and stay on track. Uh, I do believe I'll see him at some point. You know, he is welcome into my home if, if he chooses to come here. Um, I know he's got to be careful. Uh, still some people could be upset with him, especially if he was to return to New York. But, you know, that's the situation with my brother. And, um, you know, it brings me to, so hopefully I've answered that question, brings me to another question that I get all the time, and that's about betrayal. Michael, how do you feel about betrayal? Because I know you were betrayed during your time in that life. And uh, I will say this, you know, I could also be accused of being betrayal. I did betray my oath. I did not put people in prison. I did not enter a witness protection program. That's not what I was about. I didn't want to hurt anybody, nor was I mad at anybody when I left that life. Uh, but I did betray my oath. I, uh, I feel like I did it for the right reasons, not to hurt anybody or not to save myself uh, from prison. I went to prison for 10 years. I accepted a prison sentence. But I did betray my oath to, be, to uh, uh, salvage my life for both myself and my family. And that was 25 years ago, and it's worked out for me. And uh, like I said, uh, uh, so in, in that regard, I feel okay about it. But as far as betrayal, yeah, I've been betrayed. But betrayal is part of the mob life. It happens all the time. I'll give you some examples. You know, going way back, Joe Colombo, he betrayed... His boss, Bonanno and Mayoko, when they had planned to kill uh, the other members of the commission, Carlo Gambino and Lucchese uh, and Magadino, they planned to kill them. And uh, they uh, gave that job to Joe Colombo, who was a trusted soldier at the time. I think he was a captain for uh, Mayoko. And what did Joe Colombo do? He saw an opportunity for himself, so he betrayed his boss. He went to Carlo Gambino and told him, you know, that these guys are planning to kill you. And what happened as a result? Joe Colombo was given uh, the position of boss of the Profaci family. So he saw an opening and he betrayed his boss. And I think you know what happened there. Uh, Mayoko, um, they called him in. He admitted it to it. Uh, and for some reason, they allowed him to live. They had him go away. They stripped him of his title and he left. Uh, Bonanno got scared. He ran to um, uh, Canada, I believe. And after uh, a time negotiated his ability to come back as long as he stayed out of New York. He, uh, he lost his position. He moved out to Arizona. I think you know the story of Bonanno then. Uh, but there's betrayal at the highest level. Carmine Persico, my boss. Betrayal? Yes. What happened? gallo profaci war. Persico was originally with the Gallows. He was against Profaci. 
But then something happened. There was some kind of peace negotiation, whatever. Profaci convinced Persico to come to his side. Persico betrayed his boss uh, or his allies at the time. He even went after them. He tried to kill one of the gallows. Didn't work out, but he tried to kill him. So, and what had happened as a result, Profaci kind of, I mean, uh, Persico rose in the ranks. He became boss of the Colombo family. So betrayal is part of the life. I was betrayed by Rizzo, a few other people. It happens. I got even betrayed within the life. But you know what? I can't complain about that. I knew what I was signing up for when I got there. So anybody that complains about that, there's no, you have no standing to. It's part of the life. It's a life that there is treachery and you got to understand that. And that's part of it. You know, another question I get asked is, um, Michael, do you really have remorse for some of the things that you did back then? And the answer of that is, of course I do. I regret some of the things that I did. And I think a lot of people in that life, if they're honest about it, uh, you have to have remorse. I know what I can justify anything. You say, listen, I did things because I was told to do them. I had an order and I had to do them. And you know, that's correct because if I didn't carry out the order, the consequences for me would have been very severe. Is that an excuse? I don't think so now. I see things a little bit differently. I could have said no. I could have said, no, I'm not going to do that. And I could have stand, stood up for what I felt was right at that time, but I didn't. I said, hey, I took an oath, whether I like this or not, right or wrong, this is something I have to do. And uh, I have remorse for that. There was things that I did that I didn't feel good about, and I kind of had to step outside of myself in order to do it. Uh, but I did it, and I'm, I, I feel very remorseful of it. I'll tell you one thing that, you know, that, that bugs me or bothers me or hits me every once in a while until today. Somebody very, very close to me. As, as a matter of fact, he was in prison with my dad, got close to my dad in there. He made parole, came home. My dad sent him to me, and he said, Mike, this is going to be a good soldier for you. And he and I became very close. He was a great guy, stand-up guy. You know, I got involved uh, with his family, you know, and met his wife at the time, just really good person. Well, after a couple of years, it turns out that years before, there were a couple of made guys that had been kidnapped. There was a band of kidnappers going on, and they kidnapped some made guys, held them for ransom, financial ransom. And um, it was never solved who was involved in these kidnappings until later on, and this particular person happened to be one of them. And the word came down that no matter what, there's no excuse. You don't ever kidnap, uh, you know, degrade, raise your hands to a made guy. If you do that, you're done. And it just so happens that uh, that's what happened to this guy. And there was really nothing I can do to save him because the rules are the rules. And uh, unfortunately, this guy uh, was killed. And, uh, you know, that bothers me until today. And yeah, I do have remorse over that. And some of the people that, you know, that were friends of mine that are no longer here and uh, the circumstances of their demise or their death still play on me. So, uh, but I do have remorse, uh, I do. And, you know, the one thing as a Christian, and I know I get blowback from non-Christians or people that don't believe in God and say, you know, God is a fairy tale in heaven and, and they knock people that have faith. You know, you shouldn't do that. You know, there are a lot of people that believe, uh, there are a lot of Christians that believe in Jesus Christ and believe that he, he uh, you know, sacrificed his life for the forgiveness of sins and he rose again on the third day. And a lot of us believe that. We don't believe that, uh, you know, at least I don't believe that for any other reason other than that. I believe it. I believe it's the truth. I've done my research, done my work. I see how I believe God has acted in my life over the past 25 years, and, and I have a very strong belief. And hey, I believe I'm right, and uh, billions of other Christians before me share that belief, uh, and, and several hundred million share that belief now. So if we're all wrong, we're all wrong, but we don't think so. We believe it. We believe Scripture is, is solid, and it's God's Word. Um, but we as Christians believe that regardless of our sins, if we are sincerely sorry, and the word is sincerely, that's the key word, because God knows our hearts. We can't pull a scam on God and we ask for forgiveness and we accept Christ and our sins are forgiven. You can't look back. You can only look forward. And that's how we deal with things like that. So it's not, we don't abolish our own sins or our own conscience, but we have to believe that uh, we are forgiven and we move forward. So some of you will accept that. Some of you I'll get some comments. Michael, you know, you're crazy. Okay, I get it. But this is my belief. 
So um, I think that's it for today. You know, again, we, uh, I know a lot of you, oh, Michael, speak for an hour. No, 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 no. We get the analytics, 10 minutes, 11 minutes. Trust me, that's about it. Every once in a while, we'll get 12 minutes. You know, I know you skip through it and all that. That's fine. I know we're busy. There's a lot of content on YouTube. Do your thing. But uh, we're going to do that for today. Mob Movie Monday is coming up on Monday. Got a good one for you. And then we got something special for you on Tuesday. So be sure to tune in. And again, michaelfrancis.com, we welcome you on board. You need to be encouraged. COVID is knocking some people out. You need the encouragement that we give you in this group. Trust me, michaelfrancis.com, you won't be sorry. I have a free gift for you if you jump in, okay? And as far as YouTube, keep subscribing. I appreciate it. That motivates me to give you good content and more content. The interview with Sammy, we're still talking about it. Some things have got to be worked out, but... Uh, um, you know, just look forward to it. I'm not promising anything yet, but it's being worked on. So that's it for today. Have a great weekend. Prepare for Thanksgiving, no matter what the circumstances are. Be thankful on that day that you're alive and, and free and we still live in America. And hopefully that's uh, going to be the America that we came to love and not something that's going to be something that we're not going to recognize. All right. So I'll leave you with this, as I always do. Be safe. Be healthy. God bless you all, and I'll see you the next time.